Do you know what time it is? It's supernatural story time. And if you're easily scared, and even if you're not, there's only one thing left to do. Just turn off the lights, because these are stories that you listen to only in the dark. Skinwalkers and Other Beasties, Volume 3, Story 1. My car won't start. Oh, God. My car won't start. It's okay. Breathe. One, two, three. Breathe. One, two. Oh, God. It still won't start. They must all know where I am now. My white car sticks out like a ray of sunshine in the darkness of the surrounding twilight forest. I've got to get the word out. That is, if I don't make it out of this. Whoever gets this message, if you ever find yourself on a road called Bilderberg Road, do not stop driving. I did. And now my car won't start. And someone's fingers are beginning to wedge my door window down. I called the cops. When they hung up on me, I called my parents. I told them. I loved them. Then I hung up. I didn't want them to hear me sobbing and screaming any more than they had to. Now, you're all I've got left. Not sure how much time I've got until that window gets low enough for them to reach in for me. So I'll try to make this fast. My days started like most days, uneventful. I've been under some stress from work with several large project deadlines looming just on the horizon. I thought it might be do me some good to step out of the office before the shit really hit the fan. Enjoy some nature while I still could. The woods were only a few miles away from the office, after all, and it was the perfect place to decompress. When the workday was over, I hopped in my car and took off, heading straight for the trees. I know the forest roads well enough. I've lived here for a few years, and I'm no stranger to the calm, curving sweep of the roads that wind through the large oaks. Sometimes on the weekends, mostly, I'll wake up before the sun rises and head out to the forest with my sketch pad and attempt to draw the forest dawn. You know, that brief moment when the sun hits the trees through the mist and its rays dapple across the fallen leaves. I'm not that great of an artist, but I'm good enough to make myself smile. And that's what counts, I guess. Anyway, so as I was taking my after work cruise, I noticed a dirt road branching off from the paved street with a street sign I'd never seen before. Bilderberg Road was all it said. Sounded interesting enough. I thought maybe some new folks had moved into the woods. There were a few cottages and B&Bs that dotted the forest. Maybe these were its newest residents. I turned down Bilderberg Road and drove slowly for a while. The road was pitted with bumps and holes and felt like as it was in disrepair despite it being so new. A half hour eased by and the sun began to lower below the tips of the trees. It was time to go home. I love the woods, don't get me wrong, but being there as the sun sets always feels different than being there when it rises. The darkness is different, the gloom more imposing, and the bears would be waking up soon. Last thing I needed was to accidentally hit one with my car. I pulled down to what little shoulder there was and swung my car around too quickly. I heard something crack beneath me, and then everything stopped working. My lights shut off, my steering wheel stuck, and the car refused to turn back on. I wasn't worried, not yet, at least. There was still a few hours evening daylight, and if worse came to worse, I could hoof it back to the main road and hitchhike into town. Or I could call AAA and relax while they came to my rescue. I opted to go with Plan B. I rang them up and explained where I was to a receptionist who sounded like he'd just woken up. A truck would reach me within an hour or two, but most likely two. Great. I suppose I was fine with it. Two hours gave me time to walk the road a little bit more, maybe run into whoever just moved in. I hopped out of the car, put on my sneakers, and started walking. As long as I stayed on the road, there was no chance of getting lost, and even then, my internal compass was really on point, but as I was walking, I couldn't shake the uncertainty of the coming dusk. 
I wouldn't say I was afraid of the dark, but I had read so many ghost stories and skinwalker legends and seen so many shows that it was impossible not to think about the coming darkness that way. I took a breath. One, two, three, breathe, then another. Up the road ahead of me, a brown paper bag, they crumpled in the dirt road. A little odd, I thought, and discouraging. A new road, and there's already litter. I kicked the bag off to the side. At least it was biodegradable. Then I saw it. It was through the trees up ahead, a large, brightly painted brick house. It stood staunch in the trees like a boulder in a stream, and looked as though it had once been out of place. But the moss and the constant falling of leaves had assimilated it into its surrounding greenery. A small curl of smoke rose through the chimney that stretched high above the second floor, and the lights in the windows were all lit. The sun would be setting in an hour or so. I decided to say hello. The AAA driver would call me anyway, and it was only a five-mile jog back to my car. I stepped up to the front door, a large oaken thing, and gave it a friendly knock. We've no one left, an old voice called out from inside. Hello? I called back. I'm a neighbor and uh, sort of just wanted to stop by and say hello. The door opened a crack and a bloodshot eye blinked out at me. Let me see your hands, said the old voice. Weird. I showed her my hands. I just wanted to say hi. Welcome you to the neighborhood. Uh, um, in community, I guess. Shut the door, Alma. Another voice, this one. A man's yelled from deeper in the house. They haven't got a bag. Alma, the woman at the door, shouted back. I tried to peek past Alma. Sorry, is this a bad time? It's almost night, Alma said. What do you want? Just to say hi, my car. You should go home. She looked past me into the grove of trees. It's almost night. I realized that, but my car broke down a little ways away. I was just out for a walk and I spotted your house. Thought I might welcome you. So you're not selling anything? I laughed. No, just trying to be friendly. My text message ringtone chimed from my pocket. Alma's face brightened, as though a grand idea had just come to her. Oh, well. If that's all, she opened the door wide and beckoned me in. The old woman looked every bit as stereotypically grandmotherly as you could imagine. A pink shawl was draped across her flowery shoulders, and her white hair was twirled up in a fluffy bun. Pardon the mess, she said, ushering me through the well-lit hallway. The grandchildren are out back. Down the hallway, an older large man dressed in flannel came barreling around the corner and ground to a stop. What the hell are you doing, Alma, he roared. Who's this? Alma patted my arm. A neighbor. Sort of, I said. I live back in the city. The old man looked confused. How'd you wind up here? I was just out for a drive when my car broke down. I saw your house and thought I'd be neighborly. The old man and Alma exchanged a look. It almost seemed like hope, and I wondered how long it had been since they'd seen anyone other than their grandchildren. Well, the old man said, his demeanor completely changed. Pleasure to meet you. I'm Marty. We shook hands, and he led me into the den, where they had a roaring fire going. The room was a large one, filled with books and hunting trophies and overstuffed furniture. Clutters of newspapers and magazines from all different years piled up around its edges, and a few newspaper articles hung from the walls, beside the severed heads of wild game. On one of the recliners rested a shotgun. Please have a seat, Marty said. It's almost night after all. You must be tired. He scooted a few miscellaneous papers off the couch and patted the cushion. Then he snatched the shotgun from the recliner and smiled at me. Just giving it a cleaning, he said as he propped it up on a pair of pegs jutting from above the fireplace. He brushed off his jeans and eased himself down onto the recliner as Alma reappeared with a plate of cookies which she placed down in front of me. Freshly baked, she smiled. Oh, thanks, I said. So, Marty said, just out for a drive, huh? I nodded my mouth full of warm cookie. I came through here every so often to clear my head. I've never seen your road before, so I thought I'd check it out. Our road, you say? Bilderberg Road. Oh, Bilderberg Road, yeah, that would be us. Yeah, so I was cruising down the road and my car hit something and just died. 
cars have a tendency to do that. Yeah, I guess. So I called AAA and they said they'd be here pretty soon. How soon would you say? Not sure. What time is it? It's almost night. Well, yeah, I pulled my cell out of my pocket to check the time and had a few text messages and mixed calls. I flicked open the phone. Sorry, people have been texting me, I said to Marty, hoping I wasn't being too rude. Oh, no problem at all. Right, Alma, dear? Not anymore, sweetie. She smiled back and shuffled off. I scrolled through a message, all of them from AAA. Can't find Bilderberg Road on GPS. Then, please call. Bilderberg Road, not on maps. Then, urgent, call immediately. Then, urgent, remain in your vehicle. Then, do not leave your vehicle. Call immediately. Police are on the way. Huh? I said. Marty poured himself a glass of whiskey and took a sip. What's wrong? I shook my head. Guess there's bears or something outside tonight. Bunch of warnings about not leaving the car. Well, it is almost night after all. Yeah. Which reminds me, Alma said your grandkids were out back. All eight of them, and their folks too. Hence the mess in here. Shouldn't they think about coming in? Sounds like it's not a good idea to be outside tonight. Oh, it definitely isn't, he set his drink down. Alma, would you tell the kids to come inside, he called. Alma giggled from the other room. The feelings of an ease started to chill my skin again. Something about these people, as friendly as they were, made me uncomfortable. It was almost hunger in their eyes as they looked at me. Mind if I used a rush for my ass? Not at all. It's just down the hall there. I stood slowly and took a few breaths. One, two, three, breathe. When I got to the bathroom, I closed and locked the door. Then I dialed AAA. Hello. You reached AAA. My name is Ryan. What can I do to make your day fantastic? Said the same sleepy operator. Hi, I said. You guys were just texting me about not leaving my car. I'm on Bilderberg Road. Texting you about the car. Hold, please. Someone knocked on the door. Everything all right in there? Came Alma's voice. Yep, great. The tow truck called about my car. Oh, she said and shuffled off. The line clicked back on her. I said, hello? Hello, yes? Yeah, my supervisor wants to talk to you. Then the line clicked and a new voice started whispering loudly into the phone. Do not go outside, said the supervisor. Do not speak to anyone. Do not, for any reason, leave your car. Wait, what? Do not be alarmed. The police are on their way. What the hell are you talking about? I can't tell you. Not over the phone. Then the line clicked off. And I sat there on the toilet, staring at my phone for a minute. I wasn't sure what to do, so I stood up and looked around. Everything all right, dearie? Came Alva's voice again. I looked out the window into the darkening forest. I, uh, a line of 15 small white crosses stood tall against the shadowed trees. Alma? Yes, dear. Where are your grandchildren? Well, sweetie, she said slowly, like she was talking to one of her little ones. It sounds an awful light like you found them. How about you come on out of there? It's almost night, after all. I punched 911 into my phone and climbed into the bathtub. 911, what's your emergency? I'm trapped. You're trapped where? Um, I think some of your officers are on their way out to me, but I want to make sure. Where are you? Tell me, where are you? I'm on Bilderberg Road. The street's name is Bilderberg Road. Bilderberg Road? Yes. I'm in a brick house owned by these two old people and one of them has a gun. They have a graveyard behind their house. The operator sighed. I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do. What? You say you're on Bilderberg Road? Yes. You take the road through the forest and there's a small dirt road that leads off the main one. I'm aware. And I apologize, but there's nothing I can do. What the fuck do you mean? The connection cut off and I found myself staring at my phone again. What the hell do they mean? There's nothing they can do. They're the police. Sweetie, it's time to come out now. Alma said through the door. A weapon. I thought, I need a weapon. I looked around the bathroom, but the closest thing to a weapon that I could find was a bundle of soaps. No mirror to break into shards. No towel rack to rip off the wall. and The windows were too small to crawl through. Or was it? I pushed against the glass, hoping it would pop outward, but then I saw something moving in the woods, just beyond the graves. A bear? No. Something else. 
something human. I've got my shoddy aimed at the door, kid, said Marty. Come on out and we won't hurt you. I'm sure, I yelled back. Never hurt a soul in my life. Then how do you explain the graves in the backyard? The window didn't budge. I slumped to the ground. It wasn't us that hurt him. It was them. I shook my head. Them? The gun cock. Come on out. I pushed myself up and took a breath. One, two, three, breathe. I pushed open the door. One, two, three, breathe. I wanted to fly or fight even. But my mind betrayed me and my body went completely numb. Marty stood in the hallway, his shotgun raised, Alma right beside him. They didn't look at me the way I'd expected. There was no bloodlust, no rage. There was just greed. I felt like an effing poker chip. Sorry about this, kid, Marty said. He tipped the gun towards the front door. It's almost night. What's going on, I said, as terrified tears raced down my cheeks. Oh, honey, Alma said patting my arm again. You were the answer to our prayers. I don't. We ran out. It took years and years, but we eventually ran out. Of what? Sons, daughters, granddaughters, brothers and sisters. Every one of them. We had nobody left to give. Marty put my chest with a gun. Go on. Towards the door now. I took a few slow steps back. When you came knocking... I had this here shotgun pushed so far back in my mouth, I almost choked on it. What? I was going to make some arsenic cookies, but we settled on something less painful. That is, until our neighbor showed up. There was no arsenic in the cookies. Don't worry, Alma said reassuringly. We reached the door and Alma opened it. From the bottoms of our heart, we thank you. For, for what? Darling. You just bought us years. Marty swung his gun up and caught me in the gut. I crumpled to the ground, my breath blown out of me, and Alma shoved me out the door and onto their brick stoop. The door swung shut behind me, and a loud click locked it from within. I tried to breathe, but the pain was too much, and I could only suck in small, sharp breaths. Then from the woods around me, figures started to emerge dark humanoid no human there were men and women all dressed in business attire with suits and skirts and ties only they all wore bags on their heads every one of them brown paper bags with no holes for their eyes they moved towards me slowly their heads twitching back and forth like they were listening for something and they hunched over as they stepped silently through the leaves, their fingers stretched wide, ready to latch onto. Oh, God. I held what little breath I had and pushed myself up, the adrenaline in my system overriding the pain. Just let them do what they came here to do, kiddo, Marty said through the window beside me, where he and Alma stood, smiling. They paid a lot of money for this. Then I ran. I ran as hard as I could, fighting the stabbing cramp in my gut. One of the people lunged for me and I dodged, right, their clawed fingers grasping for my shirt. My car wasn't far, five minutes if I jogged, yet as I ran more people kept pushing their way out of the trees, all of them wearing the bags, some stained, others with branches or leaves protruding from them, all of them pale, with their fancy clothes and their long reaching fingers. I leapt past another one and lunged from my car door as a dozen more emerged from the woods ahead of me. I slammed the door shut behind me and hit the lock button as many times as I could. What the fuck is going on? I breathed to myself as I pushed back against the seat. They had swarmed my car, but they weren't being violent with it. In fact, they seemed to be stroking it, holding my car tenderly. When one of them scratched the diamond ring across the window, the others turned and beat her ruthlessly. And all the while, they never made a sound. Only the rustling of paper bags, the swish of cloth, the clack of expensive jewelry. It's been half an hour now. My car won't start. It still won't start. I was hoping that they wouldn't make it inside the car by the time the sun came up. But the fingers are almost all the way through the wedge they've made. I tried 
kicking at them and punching them and burning them with a cigarette lighter, but they just come back. And every time they come back, my window gets a little lower. Fractions of fractions lower, but still, there's nothing left for me to do. If you listen to this, then send whatever help you can to Bilderberg Road, if you can. I don't know why nobody else can help me. If anything, maybe I'll sketch one of the bastards outside. That'll kill time while I wait for the dawn. Or for the end, I guess. Story number two. I live on a reservation. I'm almost 19 now. I was 17 at the time, and it's always been a standing rule that we can't leave our house after sunset. There's always been bad things happening. People going missing, animals going missing, animals showing up and then mutilated animals. Weird stuff. I was allowed to have a few friends over for my birthday party. I was really excited because this land is beautiful and I always like to show it off. Three of my friends made it up here, two boys and a girl. I'll just refer to them as boy one, etc. We went for a long walk up the mountain a little ways from the res because the view up there is amazing and even though it was getting on dusk, I figured we'd be fine. There's four of us in a group together and we'd got the hiking sticks with the spears at the end and it's only a 20 minute walk back. Boy one saw the end of a goat, but it was missing a tail and it looked injured. We tried to get closer to see if it was all right because all the goats around these parts are owned. But as we got closer, it made a really loud low bleat and ran over the ridge. Boy one and I ran off the track after it and looked over the ridge. It disappeared. We stopped so we could hear which direction it was running to, but there was no noise at all. I thought it was a bit weird, and the sun was disappearing faster than I thought. So we started to head back. My friends would always laugh at the rules my family had about going outside at night, but they were about to find out why we have that rule, and I was about to get a fresh reminder. Boy one was leading us with his phone light. It wasn't that dark that we couldn't see in front of us, but the trail had just drops and rocks, and because of the bushes to the sides of us, it made it really hard to see our feet. There was this giggle in front of us. We stopped because it was really close. It sounded like a turkey gobble, which is uncommon in my area. It happened a few more times after that. The sound gave me goosebumps because it didn't sound right at all. The next thing we saw still plays with my head. Going from left to right across the path was this thing. My heart jumped into my throat. It looked like a large coyote, but its limbs were mutilated, like it was crossed between a human with sharp long claws. Its face looked distorted and human, but it was animalistic at the same time, and it had really long teeth. The scariest part is the way it moved. It was rocking back and forth on all fours like a praying mantis. It just took a step and then rocked backwards and forwards and then lurched another step forward. Its head was bowed down in between its shoulders. None of us moved for what seemed like a couple of minutes, just watching it jolt itself across the path. It looked like it was just going to go past us and leave us alone until the girl started crying and freaking out. The animal flung its head in her direction and made a really low growl, sort of like a house cat, because it had the voice behind it as well. It twisted its body around and started coming at us. It was terrifying. I yelled and threw down my spear at its head, but it was like, like it bounced off. When it got to me, it stood up. It was so tall. It barged into me, making me fall down. It started hiccuping and lurching, and then it barged into the boy one. It backed into boy two, and he landed in a ditch just off the trail. There was hardly any light on us now. When I got to the girl, it contorted its body over the top of her and held her down. She started screaming. Boy two got up and hit it with his hiking pole hard. It jolted away from the path behind us, making a crying noise, almost like it was mocking the girl. It was playing with us. We picked ourselves up and ran as fast as we could back down the path and across the reservation to my place. We told my mom what happened, and she told me and my friends the legend of the skinwalkers. I didn't sleep well that night. I kept waking up to a crying sound outside 
that would stop just as my ears adjusted to being awake. I don't want to look outside my curtains. I never want to see its face again. The girl said when it was on her it was hissing in her ear and it was whispering things to her that she didn't understand. Till this day, I still get nightmares. Next story. This story was told to me by one of my good friends who's of Navajo descent on her father's side. It happened several years ago when she was spending the last two weeks of summer visiting relatives on a reservation in New Mexico and is by far one of the creepiest things I've ever heard. My friend Jessie was 12 at the time and playing outside with her cousins. They were tossing a frisbee around and one of the younger kids threw it too hard. It flew over the fence and was swallowed up by a small grove of parched burr oak trees. Jessie, being the eldest, went to retrieve it, leaving her 11-year-old cousin Ellie in charge until she got back. The sun was setting, lighting up the sky in brilliant shades of orange as Jessie made her way over to the grove. After some poking around, she found the frisbee caught in one of the tree's branches. As she climbed, she began to sing an old Navajo song, but paused when her body suddenly went cold. That's exactly how Jessie described it to me, cold, as if she'd been dunked in ice water. You know that annoying, scary story cliché of feeling like you're being watched? Well, it's only cliché because it's true. Jessie could feel a pair of eyes following her even when she looked around and saw nothing. Seriously creeped out, she grabbed a frisbee and ran back to her grandmother's house just in time to see the old woman step onto the porch and call for the kids to come inside. The true horror didn't start until several hours later. Jessie, her cousin Ellie and Ellie's little sister Clara were asleep in her grandmother's guest room when Jessie woke up to the strangest sound she'd ever heard. She described it to me as a cross between radio static and the noise an old movie reel makes. At first it sounded distant, but after a minute or two Jessie realized it was getting closer. Beside her, Ellie rolled over and muttered, What is that? Don't know, Jessie whispered. The girls waited, holding their collective breath. By now the sound was right outside the window, and Jessie realized it was singing. At this point, in her retelling of the story, Jessie went white and began glancing over her shoulder. She told me the song was the exact same one she'd been singing in the tree grove earlier. It sounded so wrong, she said, rubbing her arms as if a cold breeze had rushed by her. Remember when we listened to that clip of the very first recording of a human voice? How weird it sounded? When I nodded, Jessie added, it was like that, but a little clearer. Somehow that made it even worse. Jessie and Ellie were both terrified, while Clara, unaware, slept on. Through the thin blue curtain over the window, they could see the dark shadow of something peering in at them. To this day, Jessie can't explain what motivated her to get up and see for herself, since she was scared shitless. Ignoring Ellie's protests, she slid out of bed and walked across the room on shaky legs. As soon as she drew back the curtain, she regretted her decision. Staring back at her was the most horrifying creature she had ever seen. It had the head of an emaciated deer, with antlers like dead tree branches and eyes so black they seemed to absorb the faint silver moonlight. It had a scrawny humanoid body with abnormally long arms and legs, and as Jessie stood there caught in its hideous gaze, it raised a clawed hand and scratched at the window with a horrible screeching sound that made Jessie's skin crawl. It was Ellie's scream that jolted Jessie out of her terrified stupor. She stumbled back from the window and landed on the carpeted floor. Clara woke up and began screaming too. Then their grandmother ran in and turned on the light. The thing at the window had vanished leaving behind three long scratches in the glass and three terrified little girls. Jessie's grandmother managed to calm the hysterical children enough so they could tell her what had happened. As she listened, her aged, weathered face became progressively paler. She hustled the girls downstairs to the living room and made up a bed for them on the couch. She then sat by them all night, and whenever one of them asked her what was going on, the old woman simply shook her head. Needless to say, Jessie and her cousins didn't sleep for the rest of the night. The next morning, Jessie's grandmother announced that everyone was to stay inside that day, no arguments. She looked so shaken, nobody dared protest. Around noon, she called for a medicine woman to come and bless the house. Later, after the woman left, Jessie marched into the kitchen where her grandmother was loading the dishwasher. Tell me what that thing was, she said bluntly. Her grandmother sighed and motioned for Jessie to sit down. You have heard the legend of the skinwalkers, yes? Jessie frowned and nodded, vaguely recalling the story. So that was a skinwalker? 
Her grandmother nodded. Yes. Grandma, said Jessie, as a light dawned. I think it overheard me singing in the tree grove yesterday. Her grandmother's dark eyes narrowed. Why do you say that? Because it was singing the same song. You know, the lullaby you used to sing to me when I was little? Her grandmother was silent for a long time before whispering. You are a very lucky girl, Jessica. But luck has its limits. From now on, you must be more careful. The look in the old woman's eyes as she spoke those words still haunts Jessie to this day. As I said earlier, that was years ago, seven to be specific. Jessie has returned to the reservation many times, each without incident, but she has never set foot in that tree grove again, and probably never will. Jessie's grandmother died this past March at the age of 87, and Jessie later moved in with her aunt for the summer so she could help clean up the old house, which the family was going to rent out. She had been there for about a week when I went down there to her, visit her. My first night, we sat on the porch and drank some beers, and I found my eyes drifting towards the tree grove. So that's where it all happened? Jessie shut her nodded. Yep. Tomorrow, I'm taking you to the medicine woman and have her bless you. Is that really necessary? The look Jessie gave me nearly turned me to stone. You think nothing will happen to you because you're white? But when you're in Navajo country, you're in skinwalker territory. Take caution. I nodded yes. That night, I swore I heard radio static outside the house. When I brought up to Jessie the next morning, she didn't speak, but grabbed my arm and practically dragged me to the medicine woman, where I was blessed. Nothing happened for the rest of the trip, and I went back to the city unscathed. I didn't really want to talk about it, because in, really it wasn't the intention of teaching a moral. But I suppose that there's something to be learned from that story of the singing skinwalker is that there are things out there we can't explain. The look in Jessie's eyes when she recounted her experience told me everything I need to know. What she saw truly horrified her. And all I can say is I'm grateful I didn't have to go through it myself.